everything we've been doing so far, we're going to go back and go over again a little bit in a, in a slightly different way. Um, so far, we've been looking at particle dynamics. And in fact, if you remember, uh, this is very much the same sequence we went through in Physics 1. Uh, we did the kinematics first. Remember what that was, the kinematics? So, oh, you don't talk to mouthful. Phil, kinematics, remember that? Well, how do we start? How do we start class? What do we look at? Both here and in physics one. Uh, well, uh, yes, specifically linear, I guess we start. In fact, we start with 1D. But what we are looking at then, uh, back in kinematics, is nothing more than position, velocity, and acceleration, and the interchange between these two, and of course, or these three, and of course, the fact that all of this happens over some time period. Uh, we started with linear. Uh, then went to curvilinear, did a little bit with 3D just to touch on it some. Um, but that's all we looked at the first couple, uh, first couple weeks in here and spent uh, even more than that in uh, Physics 1 doing just that. Then we went to the kinetics, which is where we bring in the business of how do we make sure we know what the accelerations are and how those other things are affected. And we had three different ways that we approached kinetics problems. Our first was uh, Newton's law, uh, which worked very well for general type problems, especially if uh, forces were constant, because then the acceleration is constant. It's a pretty straightforward problem. Um, but it also worked well for any problem that directly involved acceleration and or forces. Then we looked at the work energy method for solving kinetics problems. That worked real well for position dependent problems, especially those that had changes in height in a gravitational field, which was a change in the uh, gravitational potential energy, but also uh, problems where the position of the problem, of the object in the problem, affected how much uh, of a string, a uh, spring might be stretched in, in those problems that were real well in the work energy method. Then we just had a little bit with the impulse momentum method and uh, uh, how that affected uh, our ability to solve certain types of problems. Worked very well for time dependent problems. Now, we're going to uh, kind of quickly go over almost all of that again in a different way in that now we're going to do rigid body dynamics. So, some of this will be, as a lot of what we've done has been, a bit of a review from Physics 1. However, uh, if you remember in Physics 1, we, when we looked at rigid bodies, we only looked at them as uh, uh, objects that could rotate, and that was all. What we're going to do in this class, we're going to quickly review pure rotation, but then we're going to put the two uh, together and get a more general motion solution to these types of problems, where we have objects that will move to different places, but we're going to take account of the fact that the object is a real size object and its particular orientation can very much affect uh, the problem and its solution there. But then we're going to go over these things again with strict rigid body dynamics, put the two together in the general motion where we look at objects that can translate and rotate, which the simplest example is of uh, your car tires. They rotate as they move, but they also move from one place to another. So we'll do exactly that in a little bit. So uh, to open with, let's define what we mean by a rigid body.
because if we don't have a good definition of that, uh, it's not going to be clear just what we're talking about. Especially when we get to uh, certain problems in a little bit where we're going to have not one, but two, three, maybe even four rigid bodies in a problem. And we have to understand why they're rigid bodies, but the union of them is not particularly a rigid body. So imagine we've got some object here. A rigid body is that such that if we place on it three arbitrary non-collinear points, they of course will make up a triangle. Whenever you have a triangle, you have lengths of certain sides. So I'll use little letters for that, I guess. Uh, you'll have angles. So we'll call that one alpha because it's near A. We'll call this one beta. And I guess we'll call that one gamma, alpha, beta, gamma. I don't know what the Greek letter for C is, if there was one. I think gamma was G. What? There is no C. Doesn't matter, as long as we've got some labeling system. So, uh, a rigid body is that such that these things are always uh, invariant. The uh, length of the sides, uh, I guess I have to put a uh, symbol for line segment. The line segments A, B, and C. are constant, as well as are the included angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, are also constant. The values measured at any time during the problem for those three things will always be the same. David? In other words, what we're learning in strength materials about strain does not apply. Oh yeah, these, this, this is not an elastic solid like we're looking at in strength of materials, where uh, uh, that whole class depends upon the fact that real objects deform. So this is, this is very, very much different than that. But uh, don't forget in, in strength of materials, uh, we don't have acceleration of any of those things. We're always under static equilibrium. In this class, we're rarely under any situation of static equilibrium. We'll have some situations where uh, the, the acceleration might be zero, but only in a particular direction or in a, in a particular way. But there's always at least something accelerating in this class where nothing accelerates um, other than our ability to absorb new material. Nothing accelerates in strength of material, which is why it follows directly on uh, on um, statics. So what, uh, what isn't necessarily constant, those things are always constant. What may or may not be constant, and it depends upon what just what the problem is, the location of each of those points might not be constant. Um, if we had a uh, one of those points was a, the point of, about which an object rotates, then, um, for example, if it was point A, then point, the, the position vector of point A would be constant, but as the piece rotates, none of the others are constant. So that's where we're going to get the object movement, and then, of course, follow from that is that the velocities of each of those pieces may or may not be constant. And then, of course, the accelerations not only may or may not be constant, uh, may or may not be zero. <coughs> so, any one of those might be constant but any one of them might not be either in this class. However, 
uh, what is inviolate is the uh, shape of the object itself. But what can change with the second part is that the object's orientation at any time can change. Remember those uh, points A, B, and C are, are uh, arbitrarily placed and that's sufficient to define then the entire object. So that's our strict definition of rigid body. Uh, we're not going to really bother looking at it in any detail because most of the things we're going to look at are, are just so obvious rigid bodies that we'll be fine with it. But we will be looking at uh, different objects linked together uh, as we look at linkages and different machines and how they move, the dynamics of those type of things. Uh, and we'll be concerned with then the interaction of several rigid bodies. So of course a rigid body can move in translation. What that means strictly to us is that given any two points on the object, we don't need to define three, that's sufficient for the shape, but for uh, defining translation, we only need two, and there can be any two objects. Any two, ob any two points on that body, it's in translation if the kinematics of that, of those two points are uh, equal to each other. So if A moves from one place to another, then that's the same movement that B undergoes. For any two points on the object, which is sufficient to define translation for the entire object. Uh, and if that's always true, then of course it follows that the velocity of A and B are always the same, and the acceleration for A and B are the same. And we don't need to go over that because that's no different than the particle motion we just looked at. Uh, if all points move exactly the same, then let's not look at them all. Let's look at only one. And that's exactly what we did back here in particle kinematics. So we don't need to go over that again in any way. Uh, what is going to be a little bit different as we get a little bit farther in this is there are some motions that don't appear to be translational type motions. Don't forget that uh, the path from one point to the other, from A earlier to A later, could be a curvilinear path as well. One good example of that is uh, the type of example if we have a, a sign that can swing on two cables or two linkages of some kind. Even though the points don't undergo straight line paths as they go from one place to another, they'll go kind of a circular path. Each point undergoes exactly the same path. So the entire sign is in translation, uh, even though the cartoon picture doesn't quite look like it. That is a true translational motion problem. In fact, a curvilinear one. And we don't need to look at all the different points. We, we would have been sufficient to just look at one particular point and know exactly what all of the sign is doing. So it, uh, a lot of students think that that's a rotational problem rather than a translational problem. But it's not. And then that brings us directly to the rotational motion that we're going to look at. And we'll look at pure rotation uh, today just to warm things up a little bit. And then we'll put the two together, translation and rotational motion together, uh, as we look at uh, a more general type approach to these problems. So rotational motion, uh, easy, most easily, Described with a simple 
circular object, ob object rotating about a single axis of some kind. And our reference points then are some line on that object will move through some angle. So our position is governed by the angle that makes from some reference line, just like our position vectors make some uh, position uh, with respect to some reference point. And then, of course, we're concerned with the changes in those angles um, as, as, those, as this object undergoes some kind of rotation. These are vectors because there's a different direction things can move in rotation than in others, and we have to take that into account. We will use the right-hand rule for that vector notation, which is uh, common throughout all of science and engineering as far as I know. There's rumors that in Russia they use the left-hand rule, but uh, with the interaction of the sciences between the Eastern and Western, uh, I'm sure that we all agree by now. But remember that the deal with that is put your fingers, curl your fingers in the direction of rotation that automatically orients your thumb in a particular direction. In this case, it would be up. And then that will be uh, the direction of that vector that represents rotation. So we'll be able to represent it in, in uh, uh, several different, at least two different ways, where uh, either the direction of a regular vector or with a, a little circular arrow type notation. Either way is sufficient. But uh, we will be getting to several cross products. And cross products are much easier to figure out with a straight line vector than they are to figure out with a a little curly representation uh, of the very same type of motion. Once we establish the position of an object and its change in position, then of course what we're interested in its velocity, the angular velocity is defined as, well, exactly what it was in uh, physics 1 and the first part of this equation, which is or, uh, this uh, semester, which is the change in position with respect to time, time rate of change of position. We look at it in both average terms and instantaneous terms. And this is no different than what we did with our translational motion as we looked at these things. And we can also use that dot notation if we do here. So this should all look very, very familiar. There's no difference between the concepts and the notation with this rotational motion that we used in translational motion the first part of the term, other than the fact we're looking at a different type of motion, so we use uh, a different symbolism for that, but the concepts and the general notation, the general mathematical notation we use is exactly the same. <coughs> and then, of course, uh, we want to pay attention to how the velocity changes, and then that brings us to acceleration, which again is laid out in exactly the same way it was in translation. As an object changes its velocity, we can look at the average change, and we use an alpha to represent that. Make sure that uh, your alphas and your a's that we use in translational acceleration don't look too much the same. Um, 
put a little artistic flair on these symbols so that you make sure you know and you make sure I know what it is you've written. So the instantaneous acceleration was the average acceleration as measured in instant of time and that's exactly as before the uh, first derivative of the velocity. Um, most of what we did in physics one, if not all of it, and a lot of what we did earlier was constant acceleration. Uh, a lot of that will be the same here, but we'll look at some non-constant acceleration problems just because you guys are that much brighter. And then remember that the uh, double dot notation applies. In cases where the acceleration is constant as before, then the average acceleration and the instantaneous acceleration are equal to each other because they're never changing. So that's kind of our definition of average. All right, if you remember too, um, as we go through everything else, all our kinematic symbols between translational motion and rotational motion are perfectly analogous to each other. And you can get from all the translational equations to the rotational equations by simply swapping out the variables um, one for one, position for position, velocity and acceleration. And you get exactly the, the same things. All right, so we'll do a couple, we'll do a little bit here today with uh, pure rotation. And then on, uh, on Monday, we'll step into rotation and translation together in what we just call general motion. So let's look at a, uh, the type of problem we're going to see in this class. Imagine some kind of link arm that rotates around a particular point. It may or may not be joined to some other object and we need to see how that moves. This is exactly the type of things you see in, uh, in robotics, um, but we're for now just going to look at a single arm. You can imagine that that part itself is indeed a rigid body, but the object as a whole, depending upon what the other arm does, how it moves, uh, what happens at the other end of that, the object, the, the two together is not a rigid body, because we could uh, certainly imagine a triangle made out of the ends of each of those and that triangle is going to change shape radically as we go through the problems. So imagine we have an arm here whose angular velocity is changing uniformly such that it goes from Uh, 10 radians per second to 25 in 10 seconds. And if you remember from physics 1, all of the angles when used in calculations must be in radians rather than in degrees. <coughs> we might talk about them in terms of degrees. Uh, I don't know about you, I'm a lot more comfortable talking about angles as measured in degrees than radians uh, when I'm just thinking off the cuff. But for the calculational purposes, we need to keep it in radians. So, uh, given that change in velocity, this uh, arm is one foot long. want to find out something about this point here. We'll call it point P. Want to find the 
velocity of point P, actually that's the speed, uh, and also find the acceleration of point P. We can do that in vector terms. Actually, we could do velocity of point P as well in vector terms. I'll, uh, I'll see what you think we should do with that, see if you can uh, remember. Because those are actually translational quantities that come from the rotation of the object. Then also find the uh, change, change in angle. No, what I, oh, the distance traveled by the point P as well. So we want to find those three quantities. mostly just uh, review from what we've done before. Um, the thing about this velocity, though, remember, it's directly a function of the angular velocity of the piece and the distance from the center of rotation. So if you remember, Looks something like that, and that's going to be different at different times because the velocity is changing. However, what is this in terms of a vector quantity? How do we give direction to that? system that's going to work for this, and I don't know if there's a better one than the normal tangential coordinate system we established uh, some time ago with the unit vector in the tangential direction, depending upon which direction the object's actually moving, and the normal component perpendicular to that and always directed towards the center of rotation. And that's all that point is doing. It's, it's in curvilinear motion about uh, some center point, even though that's defined by a rigid body in pure rotation about the same point. So we can call that then uh, uh, in the normal direction, no, in the tangential direction, It turns out, and this is not something we used in um, Physics 1, but I expect you to be able to handle this here. This can also be determined via a cross product of omega cross r that locates the, P, the point P from the center. And let's double check that. Let's see. Uh, for this picture, our fingers in the direction of rotation, that puts my thumb into the board, so omega is directly into the board. The position vector is from this center point out to the point P, so when I orient my right hand such that I go from omega into the board towards R going out to point P, that orients my hand in this way, and that's exactly the velocity I'd expect of point P for that rotation, the direction of velocity for that rotation. So this uh, uh, is not something we could have done without a good, clear idea of what that omega vector actually represents. This cannot be crossed with RP itself. We need the right-hand representation of that kind of motion itself. All right, with changing omega from 10 to 25 seconds, we can't really work that number out. We could pick it at a particular time. 
uh, we're not going to bother with that. Uh, however, when we do the acceleration, we'll also need a particular time, so we might as well pick one. And so let's say at five seconds, what is then the um, velocity of that point, and then also use that same time to find the acceleration of those points too. Hopefully it's obvious that at five seconds we're going to be midway in between here because I did say the change in speed was uniform. So halfway between there um, is, is what, just 17 and a half. So our velocity then would be uh, RP is a distance of one foot. The uh, speed at five seconds is 17.5 radians per second. And the direction is in the tangential direction, which we don't necessarily know uh, the specifics of at the point because we don't know the angle on the arm itself, but that's sufficient to say the tangential direction. Since the velocity was changing, we needed to pick, pick a particular time, so what the heck, t equals 5 seconds. What about the acceleration of point P? That arm speeding up, which means point P is going to speed up as well. We need to figure out by how much. And again, let's just pick it and solve it at five seconds. So what's the acceleration of point P? How are we going to find that? And then let's just go through the mechanics of it with the numbers. Well, since the arm is spinning faster and faster with this changing angular velocity, then its linear velocity is going to be changing, and since the angular velocity is increasing, the linear velocity is going to increase too. That'll be in the tangential direction, so we'll have the tangential component as nothing more than the time rate of change of that tangential velocity. Well, that v dot t is just the acceleration, so we can figure out how the, how the speed of the point itself is changing. Is that sufficient, or do we need something else to go with it? a centripetal component to this as well. And that's exactly what we looked at uh, in um, Physics 1. We only looked at uniform circular motion. Uh, well, no, I guess we did a little bit of accelerated circular motion. But not much, and so we need to take into that account. That was the very same thing we did when we uh, looked at the normal tangential particle motion anyway. We're looking essentially at the motion of a single particle, that point P. So those things we can all find out. Uh, there are slightly different ways to take care of that, though, too, that uh, are a little more sophisticated than we've had before. The acceleration of point T, uh, sorry, the tangential acceleration of point P, all of these are point P, is the uh, distance point P is from the center times the angular acceleration. Nothing, we did that in physics one as well, and then this will be in the tangential direction.
However, uh, this is also a cross product in the same way that the velocity was too. So we're going to have that uh, a little bit greater level of sophistication that we didn't have in physics one as we look at all these different points. So let's see uh, what that means. If it's spinning faster in the clockwise direction, it was going 10 radians per second. I said in that direction it's going 25. So the direction the speed is increasing is in the same direction as omega is. That puts the acceleration vector also directly into the board. RP as is, was as it is before. So the direction of this cross product is the same as the direction of this cross product because omega and alpha both have the same direction into the board in this case. And that's what we'd expect. If alpha is in the board, cross it with R, that gives us an acceleration and the tangential direction in the same direction as the velocity at that instant. So that also makes sense. And that number we can figure out because we've got enough information to figure out what the acceleration, angular acceleration is there. Um, and we know that the distance is one foot from the center. The normal component we can figure out in several different ways. We can do the v squared over rho. Um, I don't remember offhand if our book uses rho or, or r. Uh, my recollection is they use rho, but r is sufficient, the same thing. Um, but this is also, oops, sorry, I need a vector sign over that one. And I'll Let's be complete. I'll put a vector sign over this one as well. So this is in the normal direction. Another way to find that out is if we make the swap r omega equals v. We can put that in here. We get r squared omega in the normal direction. This is also however, a cross product. And it's a little bit more involved one. It's actually two cross products. It's omega cross omega cross r, where, uh, don't forget, when writing cross products, the order of the two vectors is crucial. If you swap the order of these, then you've got the negative of that, so you have to do it in the right order. So we need those parentheses in there. Um, what's the term in that mass? It's not commutative, or is it associative, whichever. Uh, we need the order of which in which we do these cross products. So this one's harder to imagine because it's two cross products. Uh, however, this omega cross R, the one we have in that second parentheses, we've already got, and that's the, the tangential velocity. So I'll keep it a little more general rather than say point P. It's the tangential velocity at any time. And so that one we can do. Let's see. Remember, omega's into the board. The tangential velocity is slightly down as I've drawn it. So when I cross those, omega into the board, crossed into T gives me my thumb directed right down towards the center, which is exactly what we know the normal component of the acceleration should indeed do. So by whatever means you wish to do that, you're free to. I think the easiest thing to do is, uh, well, we've already got V the velocity of the point calculated. We know what the, the radius of the rotation is, of the distance that point P is. So I think it's just as easy to use that form 
um, right there with uh, all the pieces and not do the cross products. We'll do the cross products at times. Uh, it's just probably not the most efficient way to do it here. Since we don't have any angle, specific angle, on that, uh, that arm at any one time, we just know how it's changing in angle. So take a couple seconds, figure out what this velocity is, or sorry, that acceleration is, and leave it in uh, normal and tangential components. And, uh, and we'll be fine. And then uh, we'll come back when you've got that to figuring out the distance that point S actually travels. Now, is that supposed to be R omega squared? Or is it R squared omega? R, uh, R omega squared. Right. Thanks for staying away, Tom. Yeah, R omega squared. Okay, good catch. Yeah, the units wouldn't have worked out. And that's probably what you were looking at, Tom. Exactly. Notice that uh, the same components that are here are also the uh, scalar parts of the cross products. Because these, uh, by definition, these, uh, by, by definition of the problem, these these uh, vectors are all perpendicular anyway. So we've already got V at five seconds. Remember, do this all at five seconds because it is a changing, changing value. Um, and so you, the main part you need is alpha. So that one's easy, and then you need to figure out what the acceleration of point P is. Uh, but that's most easily done from R times the rotational acceleration, and we have enough information right here to figure out what the rotational acceleration is. Remember, I told you that it was changing speed uniformly, which is the same thing as saying constant acceleration. Got the parts filled already? Not hard. Oh, now you're doing it. Another one nearby. Why did you say five seconds instead of ten seconds? I had to pick some number. And since I'm the boss, I had to pick which number. So I picked five seconds. That number, that's just enough to tell you what the acceleration is, the angular acceleration. And then we had to pick some point because all of these values depend upon what's happening at a particular instant since it's constantly changing. So it's just an arbitrary, arbitrary choice. You should be used to the fact now that adults are almost always arbitrary in the decisions they make. Certainly your parents are. Mine were. Sorry, Mom, Dad. Right, David? Um, all right, let's see. Uh, uh, v squared over rho is the easiest way to do this, so you should be getting a uh, magnitude for the normal acceleration of point P as simply, let's see, the 17.5 radians per second quantity squared over the radius or the distance from the center of rotation, which is the one foot. And notice we get. Uh, Units then of <coughs> foot seconds. Foot seconds. No, we don't. Yeah, yeah, we 
get we get grass per foot. Yeah. No, eighty per second. Oh, seconds. Yeah. Wait, no, we don't divide those. I yeah, those all the time. No, no, no. This isn't radians. This is feet. There was. That's where the trouble was. Yeah. See, the units will always tell us what we're screwing up. Now we get feet per second squared. Because that was 70.5. Uh, this was just the one foot. I messed that part up. So now we're okay. We caught it. Uh, that's 306 feet per second squared. Three hundred six feet per second squared for that part, and then the uh, tangential magnitude. And then we're just going to multiply them by the unit vectors. So this is all we need is just the magnitudes. Uh, no, I did the normal part. I need just R alpha. And alpha is the change in velocity divided by the time it took to make that change. So 25 minus 10 radians per second over the 10 seconds it took to do that. So that gives us, again, feet per, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, feet per second squared. And that's 1.5. 1.5 feet per second squared. And so we've got now the entire acceleration. Just put it back together. 1.5 in the tangential direction plus 306 in the normal direction. So that's far and away the greater part of it, and units of feet per second squared. So now we know the acceleration of point P. What's going to be very important to us in a little while is we're going to need the acceleration of point P so we can figure out what the acceleration of the other end of the other arm is. That's exactly the type of thing that's done in uh, robotics. You need to know the acceleration of all the points, uh, assuming that all of them are rigid bodies linked together. So the last little bit I asked you to find was the change in, or the distance traveled by point P in five seconds. We know the time, we know the acceleration, we know the initial velocity. It sounds to me like a constant acceleration equation. One half A T squared plus B I T. And we've got all those numbers there. Um, comes out to be 175 feet. The change in angle that went with that is not what I asked for, but we could have figured it out and then done RP times delta theta. The change in the angle is 175 radians. But you could have done that in physics one. Hmm? Which brings us to the next part of, uh, of how all these things interrelate to each other. A lot of it comes out to be just what we've uh, had before.
remember for any one of these, or alpha equal to d omega dt, then it's also true, that's the differential form, it's also true that the integral form uh, applies as well. If we don't have constant uh, acceleration, if we have acceleration that changes with time, then we're going to have exactly that piece there to it. And the same thing with the velocity part. Using our definition of velocity and differential formula, we can make it into integral form. And it's those times when either of these or both are constants, but they just come out of the integral, and that's most of what we did in Physics 1. But not necessarily a luxury that we'll enjoy here because you're a more sophisticated student. If you remember, we did have one little piece um, that I warned you was a part that was a uh, 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 part of this that was often forgotten, so I'll give you the same warning now. If we solve this one for dt, we get dt equals d omega over alpha. If we solve the second one in the same way, we get dt is d theta over omega. Since those are both equal to dt, if we combine those two, then we get alpha d theta equals omega d omega. If you remember, I gave you a ds equals b dv when we were talking about translation and said that's one of the pieces uh, useful for solution, solving some of these problems that students often forget, especially when acceleration is a function of time, and then you can integrate this. And in fact, it integrates to the uh, uh, kinetic energy. So there you go. Don't forget those again as a, a piece of the solutions that we need to as we go through these. Briefly, just so you remember, for constant acceleration problems, which several of ours will be, especially when we get to the point of general motion, and we're going to be combining uh, rotational acceleration plus translational acceleration and letting uh, one or both of them be constant to uh, uh, allow us to get our feet wet in those type of problems that we haven't looked at before. Uh, so it's still very useful to know what the constant acceleration equations are. And they're exactly the same form as were the constant accelerations in translational motion. For example, the average velocity is the bulk change in position, angular position with time, uh, but that's also equal to the straight arithmetic average of the two numbers. This is also one of the constant accelerations problems students, uh, equations that students tend to forget. Just because it's so simple to calculate the average, students sometimes forget that that's a, a very nice thing to do. We also have as one of our equations alpha equals d omega dt or omega 2 minus omega 1 
equal to delta t. And remember, the deal with these constant acceleration equations was that each of them has four components in them. If you have those same four components in your problem, then that's the equation you use to solve. This one has uh, omega 1, omega 2, time, and, uh, and change in position. This one has acceleration, the two velocities, and time. And the only reason I'm giving them to you in this order is it's the order I gave them to you in Physics 1, low those many years ago. <coughs> So the change of position is uh, delta S equals V I delta T plus one half A T squared, only this time. We're using our angular kinematics symbols rather than our translational. And then the last one, which almost no student forgets, is uh, V2 equals V1 plus 2A delta S only we cast it in um, angular terms rather than uh, terms of uh, translation. So exactly the same uh, in translational form. Units all work out just right. Keep an eye on them. We will have the additional parts, though, that I've already given you of uh, the translational velocity of a point is the cross product of uh, uh, the two vectors defining its motion and the tangential acceleration of some point is also a cross product and the normal is yet a third cross product. But it comes in two flavors. Just in case you're not in the mode to do three cross products. This one, you've got to do this first cross product that results in a vector. Then you've got to do the second cross product with your result. And you can't mess up a single minus sign. You can't mess up a single multiplication. You've got to get it all right. constant angular acceleration problem. All right. Imagine a small motor here used to run a much larger blower of some kind by means of a belt going around the tube. Actually, this is a constant acceleration problem. We'll do, we'll do this, and then we'll do a non-constant acceleration problem. All right, so the, uh, the motor has an angular acceleration of two radians per second squared. The radius of this Let's call this one A and this one B. The radius of the motor pulley is 0.15 meters. And the radius of the blower pulley is uh, 0.4 meters. So this is a constant acceleration problem one still. 
Um, but it's getting a little more complicated. Now we have two rigid bodies connected. Plus, it's going to bring up a very important point, one that uh, we briefly addressed in uh, Physics 1. Um, but uh, we didn't need to put a lot of weight into it other than the fact that uh, we considered it true. So I want to figure out the acceleration and velocity of point P after two revolutions of the uh, motor pulley, A. So instead of defining that uh, by time, a point in time, we define it by a particular position. So this is a constant acceleration one. It's not going to take anything more than uh, the type of stuff we had in physics one. <clears throat> And then this time, we can be a little more specific with the vector since we're taking that point at the bottom there. So, the acceleration of point P, remember, is going to be a normal component and a tangential component. And we know something about how to figure out both of those. And then, the velocity of point P is going to depend upon uh, whatever its velocity is at that time. Uh, but we're going to need that for the normal component anyway, for the V squared over R. That's probably the easiest way to do it. You can do the vectors if you want, the cross products. Give that a simple coordinate system to that. Okay, so with a couple minutes uh, a lot of to you. See if you can't chug through through that rather quickly. Notice that there's a uh, a ratio between the angular velocity of A and that of B and the angular acceleration of A and that of B. So the uh, velocity and angular components you need in the uh, equations are those of the blower pulley B rather than the motor pulley A. Right in here. Let's make that face like, like I'm speaking German. I don't know, you speak German? Yeah, so it can't be that. I don't either, so it would sound terrible. So what we're given here with this, this two revolutions, that two revolutions, is you're sort of given delta theta. Not specifically, because remember, revolutions is not a measure of angle. We need radians. So you just have to convert that two revolutions pi radians per revolution, and then you have it in radians. Remember, all of our angular measures, as used in the equations, are uh, radians. Uh, these are sometimes referred to as, as uh, engineering values, because engineers are very common to be speaking in terms of revolutions per minute, etc. That's got to be affecting the picture of that flickering a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if it gets all the way up to the board. All right, one important assumption we need to make here, and it's going to be very important throughout the next, the rest of the class is we're assuming through all of this, and it's not always true, and you can confirm that with uh, things you do with your car, 
we're assuming that the belt does not slip, that there's a no-slip condition between the belt and the pulleys. If it does slip, things are all together different. So we have to assume for this that the belt does not slip. That's not necessarily the case when you're starting up a motor, which we are here because we have an acceleration on the motor. And that's the squealing you'll sometimes hear in your car if your uh, fan belts and other pulley belts are slipping, especially when you turn your power steering, you turn your wheels. Tom, has that happened to you recently? No. Yeah, if you turn your wheels pretty far to the side, it really puts a, a lot of strain on the uh, power steering motor and you'll hear the belt slipping. Don't try to pick up a girl with a car with uh, swinging belts, that's what I always say. What's the question? Is that not working? That's not the number I got. Certainly we can multiply 2 times 2 pi together. Oh no, this, uh, this is delta theta. So what this really is is delta s, since you have the, uh, the distance in there. Once you've got delta theta, then you can find the distance that point traveled by doing r delta theta. Right, Joe? velocity of point P based upon the velocity of any one of the points on the motor pulley because they're uh, intimately connected by a non-slipping uh, pulley. In fact, so that's the purpose of using a chain instead of a belt is it ensures non-slipping because of the, uh, the teeth on the gears and the rollers on the chain. So it's some, many of the same type of things we had to figure out before. I mean, the velocity of, of this point P, which you can figure out from the velocity of any point on the motor pulley, since they're going to be the same with the uh, belt not slipping. But then you'll also need the acceleration of point P, and that you've got to get using the ratio of the diameters for any the acceleration of, of the uh, motor pulley. reflection on the board that it's a distraction for the camera. Believe me, Joe, we're not amateurs. We do have a professional in the room. Dave, does that make sense? Phil, all right? You 
could do it with these cross products. I don't know that it makes much sense to do that. Uh, it will for some slightly more complicated problems where we've got lots of different positions on these things. But we need a couple pieces as usual. Uh, we need the velocity of point P, of course, in the tangential direction. That obviously is going to be in that direction. And that will be the same as the velocity of uh, any of the other points because they're all connected however fast the belt's moving. So we can figure that out. R A omega A. Remember, though, that's after two revolutions, so we're going to have to find that part. And that also becomes RB omega B. Uh, but our, uh, omega A and omega B are related by their uh, the ratio of their uh, radii. So that's a, a pretty quick fix. So the angular velocity of A, since it's constant velocity, we can find that out after two revolutions from one of our uh, constant acceleration equations. We're given the acceleration and the change in position and assuming it's Starting up from rest. You didn't say that. You didn't ask. See, I was sitting here looking at that. <laughs> no, I, 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 I said when starting up, it won't slip. But that was in the discussion about belt slippage. Okay, well, I'm, what I'm see, I was I was making sure that you listen to me at all times, rather than just occasionally stopping by to listen. All right, once you find the angular speed of pulley A after the two revolutions, then you can find the angular speed of B and the velocity of point P. And then once you've got the velocity of point P, then you can figure, you start figuring out the uh, uh, acceleration components. The uh, tangential acceleration of point P, remember, is the angular acceleration of B uh, times the radius of B. And the angular acceleration of B is again related by the ratio of the radii. And those are pretty straightforward to come up with. And then the normal component is the velocity of point B squared over the radius of B. Now, uh, we're going to have lots of different things. Uh, gears, pulleys, link arms, and all kinds of things, and mesh, so there's going to be lots of radiuses in these problems, lots of radii. Be careful, pay attention to the fact that you got to have the right ones in the right place. That should give you all the pieces, and then you can even figure out the magnitude of the acceleration of point P. Getting there, the end. So I guess we got to make this a get out of class question. Oh, um, now David's wishing he'd worked a little harder on it. Could have gotten out early.
Chris, you got some stuff? Want we'll to check it and see if your weekend's starting? Sure. You have your doubts. All right, what's that? Acceleration of point P? Is that the total acceleration? Uh, not quite what I got. What'd you get for the components? Where are those? Uh, no, I didn't get the point six. I had point three. For what? And I had two point eight one, not two point two six. So double check you're using the right radii for those pieces. What did you get from PP? For the velocity of point P? Uh, 106, 1.06 1 meters per second. Yeah, 1.0. WA2, 2.7. Could be, could be round off. WA. Yeah. I have 2.66. Great. Let's make sure we're looking at the right number. This one. That's after two revolutions. Right. Okay. Seven, seven. Right. Seven point oh nine. Well, no, that's unsquared. I had 709 there. Let me make sure we're looking at the same thing. So omega A. Oh, wait, I put delta X. Yeah, 709. Okay. I put the wrong term. Yeah, but in engineering, we need real numbers. We don't work with pies. What's real number? In math class, it is, not in engineering class. Maybe it's the flashing lights. Yes. Frying your brain. I don't see other pieces to look at. The delta S, I didn't figure out directly, didn't ask for it. Well, we're getting right near the end. Let's, let's put these together, and then uh, you don't have to stay the whole weekend with me. So, this should give an omega A. of 709 radians per second. That's the speed of A after two revolutions at that acceleration, that constant acceleration. Um, so then you can use that then to find the angular velocity of B at the same time. And since A is little, it's going to run a lot faster than is B. by the ratio of their radii, and I have 266 on that one. Did you get that too, Tom? Okay. And then that one, we can use, uh, it might be the easiest way then for finding the velocity, sorry, the acceleration of point B, because then that would be RB omega B squared. And we have those two numbers. And that should be 2.81 meters per second squared. Anybody have that number there? That's, let me make sure that's the normal, yeah, normal velocity. And then for the other one, the acceleration, um, the acceleration of uh, the acceleration of point P is the same as the acceleration of any point on the belt. So we could have looked at it up on the upper piece. Then two, we can get that with R A alpha A equals R B alpha B. We know alpha A. We know the two radii. We can find alpha B. Um, in fact, we just need RB alpha B. We don't need to uh, take that apart. We can just use it like that. So that should have been 0.3. Uh, wait, let me make sure I'm writing down the right one. That's the tangential. Well, 
velocity is 0.3, which is exactly what this P is. R alpha. And then you can put those two magnitudes together. Plus 281 meters squared per second squared. And you should get 283. No, wait, actually, that's, that's meters squared seconds to the fourth. Square and then we square root them. Notice that once again the uh, centripetal component is the dominating part of the acceleration. Is that hand up? Andy? Yeah, um, like a, what, it's okay? Or? Quite yeah, that's the uh, self normal acceleration in the last place. Right here? Yes. Yes. But just below it. But you can either calculate it using v squared over r, right. or you can calculate it using r omega squared. Whichever you have uh, easier, we happen to have omega, so it was just easier to do that. Yeah, since yeah. Uh, the acceleration of any point on that belt is the same as anywhere else, since the belt's not slipping, then you can set these as equal. That's also uh, sort of a subtlety that students tend to uh, just forget in the confusion of uh, looking at new problems. Right there? Yeah. That's the acceleration of point P in the tangential direction due to the acceleration of the angular acceleration of the motor. Uh, yeah. Tom, you get those? Yeah, I got 2.85. Okay, yeah, that's, that's probably just right. All right. Then. One, the 1.065 one is that's the velocity. 1.065. You're going to try to get omega from that. I don't have a 1.065. But that's, isn't that what the velocity is? Oh, yes. I believe so. Oh, well, I just didn't happen to write it down. This velocity. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, it's just uh, that angular velocity times the radius there.